David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday, April 14th, 2023. Time for another show. It's a Friday show. Ordinarily, another solo flight here. But as it happens, uh, because Greg Dworkin has had everything rescheduled, we rescheduled his Wednesday and or his Thursday to be today's Friday, uh, which if you're listening via podcast, and who knows what day it is if you're listening via podcast, Maybe today, maybe a year from now, we don't know. Uh, you won't know the difference. What you will know, I mean, you'll notice the difference in the show. You won't know what day it is. It doesn't matter. Uh, all days are the same. They're more or less running into one another at this point. We've done two solo performances, I guess you could call them, in a row. And so uh, very uh, welcome is the intervention of Greg Dworkin, or the reintroduction of Greg Dworkin's Morning Raft O Stories. Lots to catch up on. Uh, since yesterday's blockbuster, I don't know, well, you, when, when you, you screw up and you spend three quarters of a show on one story, you gotta go back with the sensationalism and say it was a blockbuster story. We didn't report it, you know, we never report these things. We just read them. But, uh, all right, I don't know. I guess congratulations to us for understanding that this was a fast-moving story and that although it had already been on the record for like two days, we better hurry up and get the the meat of it on the record before somebody got arrested for it and it became an even bigger story. And then by yesterday, uh, they had, in fact, arrested somebody for it. I mean, that's not difficult to predict or anything like that. We read the story and we're like, wow, that's just flat out espionage and it sounds like they have everything they need to identify this person and arrest them so i imagine arrests will be imminent and as it turns out arrests were imminent not not before of course people took to social media to talk about this uh, article in the washington post and say how why hasn't he been arrested yet and the answer is we had to oil the handcuffs i guess and uh you know gas up the van and then drive out there and arrest him because the guy was under arrest within a couple of hours. Uh, anyway, also good questions being asked via social media, as all good questions are asked these days on social media. Uh, interesting point. Uh, let's see. Can I, uh, how do I uh, call up my own history here very quickly? What's the easiest way to do that? All right, I'm pressing this button. Uh, who was it so that I can properly credit Tom Sullivan? Tom Sullivan uh, commenting on the picture of the arrest of this suspect. And there'll be more to say about this suspect. Uh, I, I'm not done. Another three quarters of a show. I don't know. But anyway, commenting. Now, why didn't Trump get this kind of escort? He is, of course, being uh, taken in, you know, escorted. I can't tell which direction he's going into the truck, out of the truck, you know, armed SWAT team type guys uh, uh, whisking him off to who knows where. Uh, though he told his followers it would be Guantanamo. We'll see. But asking, why didn't Trump get this kind of escort? But, you know, tongue in cheek way of doing it, too. This is this will actually make and maybe Trump wanted this to be look more like a martyr. Why didn't Trump get this kind of escort? He was president after all. Is he not patriotic? Did he not also abscond with secret documents to show off and impress his friends? Why the disrespect, DOJ? He's from a patriotic family and alleged and allegedly leaked U.S. secrets. That's actually the headline on today's Washington Post story about this. Uh, yeah, once again, illustrating the weird confusion that even the media will occasionally fall into when a certain type of person who, well, you know, is inclined eventually to, to do things like massive amounts of espionage against the United States will still claim to be a patriotic person. And they'll just kind of run it at the, at the, as the headline. But I think these days, uh, everybody knows whenever somebody refers to themselves as a patriot, you have to first check and see, you know, is there a wink with that? Or is it uh, what kind of patriot are we talking about? Somebody who actually, you know, feels uh, allegiance to the country or somebody who wants to overthrow the current system of government and replace it with one about which they would feel more patriotic, i.e. something they made up themselves. Uh, so now becoming a loaded term and, uh, well, there's lots to learn about this guy. And, uh, I don't know, we learned an awful lot of it yesterday. And, and as it turns out, he's 
everything you would have thought once you realized that he was a 21-year-old kid leading a band of 16-year-old, essentially, you know, incel uh, gamer weirdos around by the nose, telling them about the way the world really worked, which he had discovered in his 21 years. I have met very few 21-year-olds who have figured out the way the world really works by that point, but, uh, you know, it does happen from time to time. But one of the ways it doesn't happen is by telling people that the Buffalo supermarket mass shooting was a government set-up job to uh, lobby for more police money in the budget. I mean, one thing, you don't actually need to lobby for more police money in the budget. For another thing, that's a racist Q-level lunatic theory, and these kids were still pretty sure he was so smart. He was ahead of every, he he really had a handle on the way the world worked. And then you got this picture, and he's a baby. So that'll work to his advantage at trial, I'm sure. So uh, I, I can go ahead and say so, because they'll be claiming so uh, when it's time to hold him accountable for his espionage. All right, uh, let's get to the real meat of today's story. It's Friday, but Greg Dworkin is here. So we're happy. Let's start right away. Good morning, Greg. How you doing? Good morning. Let's Doing go. fine. All right. See, you know, speaking of that patriotic stuff, fine. Uh, yeah. it's not just talk. The Washington Post actually tweeted that they had yes. breaking news. The 21 year old arrested in connection with the leak of U.S. secrets is from a patriotic family. I can't believe it. Online. He took on a persona at odds with his military career. Yada, yada, yada. You know, no. what what makes him patriotic? That he's uh, a white male? Yes, apparently. Uh, well, Murdery Trader Green thinks so. I, by the way, I have to throw that in there. She's out there already. She's incredible. What a nose for politics. She's out there defending this now espionage suspect, saying that Biden was targeting him because he's a white male Christian. And that's really the answer. Rather than actually target the source of this guns. espionage, we're just randomly arresting Christians because damn those Christians. We love guns. I mean, yeah. she's doing it for a reason. She knows that it's damning uh, stuff. And uh, like Kyle Rittenhouse, the best thing the to do is. is when you're in a bad position is to adopt the uh, bad things and fight back with them. I guess so. I mean, I mean, it's a strategy. And so she's doing it. And, and you know, it, it again, good it's hanger. like the abortion thing writ large. It helps you with your base and it really doesn't help you with like normal people, which is most of this country. Mm, it's yes. just so weird. And, and we'll get to uh, that when it comes to abortion. PS, but it's Q-Anon. the same concept. Yeah, and it's also QAnon level stuff. And Q game recognizes Q game. She went right to him, right? Uh, and there's another aspect of that, which uh, perhaps will foreshadow by simply saying that one of the things that uh, the the uh, MAGA wing of the Republican Party, which is to say the Republican Party, uh, <laughs> uses to recruit people, yes, is this concept of freedom. Groomers, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're the Freedom Party. We yeah, do yeah, freedom. Yeah, sure. Freedom is us. Right. Freedom, freedom are to us, do our you know, The backwards are. And the thing is that they get Ooh, really are. defensive and really scared when the Democrats or some opposition to what they're doing mm-hmm. actually adopts freedom as something important. You see that with abortion. Taking Abortion choices away from people is yes. stepping on freedom. What? They know that, and it scares the bejeebers out of them. Uh-huh. So whenever they see a, quote, patriotic freedom issue, they jump on it. They feel like they have to defend that tooth and nail because if they lose that, they lose the recruitment. Oh. So that's my theory for why Marjorie Taylor Greene jumps on this stuff. Uh, I guess. I mean, it's as good as any other theory. There's, I mean – if you don't, I don't know what to tell you. There, you know, obviously, not to look for any sort of logic. So I guess any theory could go, but that's as sound as they get. Well, you know, there there is some logic to it, and in to fact, theory, that we'll yes. present evidence. We'll present the evidence, Your oh, Honor, uh-huh. uh, about how this is true for the abortion issue, and why isn't this true for the same issue, uh, or the uh, different issue with the same people doing the same thing? So mm. we'll, we'll get to that. You think it's irrelevant? I'll tell you. I need to present this because it'll tie into what we're doing later, Your Honor. Just okay. give me the time to make the case. All right. The script says, to, for me to say, I'll allow it. I'll, I'll allow, allow it for it. now. Yes. We'll go back to it and I may tell the but jury to get to, to your point, counselor. You <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah, right. So let's do some lightning round stuff because I think there's some other stuff I'll happening allow that's of lightning. interest. 
You allow okay. that? Yes. Yeah, put your feet on exactly. the desk and wear a big sombrero when you say that. <laughs> um, Trump answers questions for seven hours in New York fraud lawsuit. No. Remember, the last time he went to see Letitia James, who uh, Trump characterized as that racist uh, oh, attorney general, oh, like oh, all the oh, other racist attorney generals, like they keep, uh, Alvin They keep Brad. racistly charging me. Uh, last time he went to talk to her and had tea, uh, hmm. he answered the fifth for like uh, six hours or something. Hmm. This time, according to his lawyers, no, he was actually having a real conversation because it was an opportunity to tell the judge for seven hours how successful and rich he is. Ah. The Alvin Bragg thing... Yes. Is about uh, his lawyer, Michael Cohen, hiding from New York State the fact that he was paying money to Stormy Daniels to not talk, catch and kill stuff. Yeah. And in the process of doing that, perhaps other crimes were hidden. That's the concept behind the Alvin Bragg case. Right. Okay. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. This one is a little different. It's parallel. But Letitia James is simply looking to see whether Trump and his company were lying about how much they were worth so that they could uh, jack up uh, real estate prices but mm -hmm. lowball taxes. So yes. on the one hand, I'm worth lots. a lot of money, so buy from me because I'm really successful. And on the other hand, to the tax people, I'm broke. I, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's the uh, uh, Alex Jones uh, uh, plea to the Sandy Hook families. I'd love to pay you, but I just don't have any money. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I think he pulled the same game with Stormy Daniels. Uh, sleep with me. I'm a billionaire. I can make so all sorts of things happen for you. Uh, now it's done. I need you to shut up. Uh, but no, I'm not going to pay you a million dollars. I can only get the 130000 together. I'm so poor. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so Trump previously met with James's lawyers, uh, Letitia James's lawyers, August 10th, refused to answer all but a few procedural questions, invoked the Fifth Amendment rights more than 400 times. Nope. So he was there for seven hours yesterday. And he is going to be there again today, I think. So right. here's that. For the fifth time. <laughs> uh, he's going to do the fifth for the Probably fifth the, time. Five, like I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I hope it's five because that would work best. Right. Uh, now, completely unrelated but of interest, uh, Michael McDonald has in Substack, the U.S. Election Project, has hmm. a nice little piece here. Uh, this is a story you may have heard. There's something called the Electronic Registration Information Center, or ERIC. Hi, ERIC. And ERIC is a thing where, because there's no centralized voting base, yeah. states can share registered information. So in theory, uh, states could find out that you voted in Virginia, and then you moved to Texas, and you voted in Texas. Okay. Or uh, you pretend to live in North Carolina, but you really vote in Virginia, stuff oh, like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got a lot of that going on. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Get to so it, Eric. it's a thing. And uh, it's a bipartisan thing, not a nonpartisan thing, but a bipartisan thing. It's a compact between states known as ERIC. Uh, as Mike McDonald writes, ERIC members share their state voter registration files with each other so they can identify people who move across state lines and nab people who attempt to vote more than once. Sounds like uh, something Republicans would actually really enjoy. Exactly, except for this other thing that Mike McDonald points out, which hmm. is the reason why they're pulling out that you don't uh. know about because like, nobody talks about it. States also share their driver's license databases, which allow states to conduct voter registration drives among unregistered but eligible voters. Uh-huh. Eligible oh, okay. but unregistered. Yes. EBUs, they're called. <laughs> Are they? Because right. like everything has to have letters. All right. The Limu Ibu. Okay. And here's the holdup for Republicans. All right. There was a thing back in 1993 oh. called the National Voter Registration Act or the Motor Voter Law. Oh, yes. Motor voter laws require states to provide registration opportunities at driver's license and public assistance agencies. Now, states administer it differently. Some are good at it. Some are not good at it. But it's a thing. Yeah. All right. So if people who interact with a driver's license agency are offered voter registration at that time, they're entered into the state's database and shared with Eric. They're not considered eligible but unregistered because they had this contact with motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now, the deal struck by Democrats and Republicans 
states get cleaner voter registration rolls, which reduces waste and fraud, but you also are required to do voter registration outreach, required. Mm -hmm. That compromise worked for a time. Everybody was doing it. But recently, Republican states started bailing out of ERIC. Hmm. And so they wouldn't have to. the real substantive reason why Republican states are leaving ERIC is they don't like this EBU outreach stuff. <laughs> In other words, ERIC not only identifies fraud, which they love, but yes. it requires you to try to register voters who are unregistered, which means bringing in more voters to the polls, mm. which is anathema well, to them right now. But that's because they they're to... in stolen election mode, sort of. But more importantly, they're in Tennessee. Uh, we know that uh, we may or, or better Wisconsin. Hmm. We know that we're the minority. But right now we have all the power. And if we let even only a few more people vote, we will lose our gerrymander power. We will Maybe. lose everything. Look what uh, happened to the Supreme although, Court. We don't want more people to vote. Yeah, I do think I mean, it, we kept hearing that uh, that was where a lot of the MAGA voters came from, too, uh, that they also were unregistered because they were tuned out of the system, uh, skeptics and disbelievers, and uh, were brought back into the system by uh, the lunatic fringe. And, oh, look, there's lunatics running for office. We're lunatics. Let's vote. Right. So, so Michael McDonald is isn't really a super fan of Eric and the mandatory motor vehicle part because states just don't do it all that well. OK. Uh, and he recommends Democratic states rethink their position and make it voluntary rather than mandatory. If they did that, people would come back into Eric because overall it's a good thing. Mm. But that's why they left. So when you read stories about yet another Republican who last week said they love Eric, this week says it's terrible and they're pulling huh. out. That's what's going on. OK, this more of the same. I, I love this country, but I also support espionage when it's done by people who love guns or uh, whatever. Well, you know, I love this country, but I like espionage when it actually gets dirt on my opponent. Yeah, right. I'm going to blackmail uh, allies. C-2016. Yeah, sure. Or this morning. So or this morning. It you happens know, but, all but the time. Basically, that's how it works. So that's what's going on with Eric with here. Huh. And also, it reminds me a lot of uh, resistance to uh, Medicare expan- Medicaid expansion under uh, Affordable Care Act. Yeah, billions of dollars on the table, and Republicans make it their position to say no to it because that's cooperating. They don't want to give credit I, to the black yeah. guy, but now that the black guy isn't in the White House, you know, maybe it's okay. Maybe. So now they're beginning to do that, but here they are, uh, you know, again, I don't like this uh, bipartisan cooperation thing. It registers people to vote, so uh, we're going to get out of this voter database that helps us catch the most important fraud happening anywhere. Uh, Which we, we claim is yeah. the most important election right. issue. We now quit it because it might also mean we'd have to do something. Yeah. Which, yeah. All right. Well, they're jackasses. And everybody or as hates they them. like to say in Thank Tennessee, you. we're not going to do anything. Uh, yes. Except throw you out for asking us to do things. Well, even that didn't work. Good. Next big story in our lightning mm. round, of course, is the uh, second shoe Ooh. with Clarence Thomas. Uh, he not only took uh, half yes. a million dollar vacations uh, paid for by Harlan Crow, but apparently Harlan Crow brought bought property from him. Yeah. Now, the justice didn't and disclose the deal, him. and basically Crow bought a couple of empty lots and then built houses on them. The important thing is it's a direct link for Harlan Crow giving Clarence Thomas money. Yes. So when you right. throw that on top of everything else, uh, whether it's legal or whether it's not legal, whether he paid uh, market prices or whether he didn't, it still yeah. smells to high heaven. Yeah, I, he's a big time pro giving money to Clarence Thomas all the time. Yeah, it's happening a lot. Uh, our dear friends who bought all this real have? estate property from us. And he's a big time, comes from a big time real estate development family, like giant office buildings and, and city projects. And here he's buying like a tract of three lots in a suburb somewhere. Well, he got two no vacant lots reason. in the house where Thomas's mother was living. Yes, and uh, I which he then fixed up. Yeah, he he repaired the house, uh, renovated the house, and left her in there, and just said, eh, "You know, hmm. I, I own the house, but why why don't you live there instead of me?" Okay, no no big deal. So you know, again, just more information, and it just, uh, of course, stories that like that like make all the other reporters want to go. Okay, well, you did the lovely job on Clarence Thomas. Why don't we look into Brett Kavanaugh and his. Uh, uh, credit card bills. Yeah, because what is it? Only only uh, 
Only black guys do stuff like this? I mean, uh-huh. hey, what are you, Let's racist? See. Let's, Let's see. see. I mean, it's a, it's a Supreme Court justice. It's unbelievable, but is it? So, so more to come on, you know, you got to think that uh, ProPublica may even have more on Thomas, but we'll see if anybody has anything on Kavanaugh. They do seem pro-public. Next uh, topic here I have in the lightning round, hmm. all the things I was saving up. And it's an interesting oh, thing about Dianne Feinstein. It is. It is. Uh, she hasn't been in Washington. She hasn't been well. Everybody knows she's having some cognitive issues. She's also had shingles, according to her staff. Yeah. And she's on the Judiciary Committee and hasn't been showing up. Right. And so that makes it harder for the Democrats to uh, pass judges. So people were complaining. In fact, two past uh, House members, two House Democrats, suggested she resign over her health. Yes, or right, At which she got to make her staff to say, else. "Well, we'll allow uh, somebody to substitute for her on the Judiciary Committee," which is an interesting thing because I think it takes sixty votes. However, Republicans may cooperate with that, maybe because Why? it's the Senate and they're trying to preserve Senate prerogatives. They don't like the idea of people saying, hey, you know, at your age, maybe you should get out because, like, that's all of them. Mm, yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, you know, it's also so we'll possible see. that they'll say, uh, no, to hell with that. And then when you come for us on the same basis, we'll say, screw you, we're hypocrites. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm not predicting what's yeah. going to happen there, and I really don't know the mechanism. It's just, you know, for the record, well, you can't simply have Chuck Schumer say, okay, I'll just substitute somebody. That's yeah. not how it works. Right. Well, we you discussed it a bit votes. yesterday. Uh, yeah. Because well, it's done after they already formed. Right. They need to, when you get, when you Which name you explain, change the person. I don't personnel, really understand it. I it's just easy. say it. You do understand it. It's, uh, when you change personnel on a, on a committee, it's not just snapping your fingers. You have to pass a resolution to do it. The body has to agree. This is now the new lineup of this committee. That means a resolution. A resolution means a filibuster. A filibuster means 60 votes. So uh, there's that. But actually, that's not the part that I thought was really interesting. Because you already knew it. <laughs> I knew it, but I didn't understand it. Now I understand a little better. The thing that I thought was really interesting is who's defending her, saying, leave her alone. Marjorie Taylor Greene. No, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Why does it make sense? Uh, They're both from San Francisco. Yes, and so is Gavin Newsom. And Mm. in California, the San Francisco Mafia, as they call them, has really run politics in California for a long time. And now you're picking on another San Francisco Mafia member, Diane Feinstein, and they are protecting mm. their prerogatives because all these young upstarts like <laughs> Rokahana and Barbara Lee and, uh, uh, you know, Barbara uh, Lee, Katie. Uh, oh, yeah. Porter. Porter. Yeah. Barbara Lee. Uh, was all these not young a, progressives a, are trying to push the San old, Francisco but. moderates who, by the way, I think averaged like, uh, you know, 80 years old mm. out of leadership positions. And they don't like it. And they're pushing back a little bit. I mean, okay. But really, that work needs to get done. Even Feinstein knows, or at least her staff. Nancy Pelosi suggested Thursday a double standard was being applied because Feinstein was a woman, Mm -hmm. noting she's never seen a man in that position facing similar calls. Well, that's easy. I think that uh, uh, Chuck Grassley should resign. I think that Mitch McConnell (laughs) shouldn't come back to the Senate. Okay, that's taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I mean, I kind of see her point, but I don't think it holds up. And I think yeah, she but knows it's that. not really a point. Okay. Uh, now the thing is that the you know who would replace her and the San Francisco Mafia mm. are supporting Adam Schiff. Ah, uh, but huh. Katie Porter and Barbara Lee are also <laughs> running. <laughs> right. They're not going to like that. Right. And so that's the thing. You know, part of the reason to keep Feinstein there from the San Francisco point of view yeah. is that you don't have to deal with, uh, you know, endorsing the next person. That's but the true. one they want is not what the rest of California wants. And if it turns out that Barbara Lee winds up getting the nomination and mm. their person doesn't get the nomination because Lee could beat Schiff in a primary. It's possible. Yeah, sure. Porter could beat Schiff in a primary. Yeah. Schiff could beat the both of them. We don't really yeah, know. But they don't I like don't the idea that they don't know. That's true. That's interesting. Um, hmm. Uh, shouldn't Nancy Pelosi? Uh, I don't know how what her position Pelosi is. Pelosi suggested on... political agendas might be at work in the calls from Representatives Rokahana and well, Dean yes. Phillips for Feinstein to resign. Sure, of course. Khan is backing Lee, 
Oh, okay. Newsom is a to promise to appoint it. a black woman to the seat. Hmm. We don't know what's going on. Hmm. Um, they're already talking about uh, multiple names in case you retire. So this is what's going on here. There's a whole lot of uh, hmm. uh, jockeying going on about who the next person is. And has a lot to do with defending Feinstein. So it's not necessarily defending her on the merits. That is to say, uh, hmm. she's such yeah, a beloved figure. We don't want you to touch it. That's not what's going on here. So that's really my point in bringing it up. Okay. That seems uh, helpful because otherwise you say, you know, well, what is Pelosi? Well, why, why, would, why wouldn't everybody get behind, you know, moving her? Yeah. Because like it's for her own good. And, you know, otherwise it looks like the staff wants for her to stay good. because the staff wants to stay in power. Yeah. Because the staff is running the office. That's true. And, well, you know, <clears throat> you've been staff and that's not a good position for staff to be in. And yet it happens. <laughs> yes. Uh, and they're unelected. And sometimes they're, you know, in their 20s and whatever. Uh, OK. Well, that's an interesting explanation. I, I don't think we have any idea. We'll probably never get any idea where Pelosi is in terms of who would she like to see as a replacement. As well, we'll a never get an idea of what yeah. Nancy Pelosi really thinks because uh, well, she's Nancy Pelosi. You know, close to the vest and all. Yeah, Smart. but the fact of the matter is Diane Feinstein really needs to resign. Yeah. Uh, she does. Yeah. I mean, she can't do the job anymore. Yeah, that's okay. You did well for a very long time, and, you know, you can't do it forever. Eventually, you know, you do leave, so whatever. Maybe, anyway, okay. Everything so, is more complicated than it is. It is. Why can't you just simply do Because it's the Senate. Nothing is simple. Yeah. You go and can't just wish for something and have it happen. You have to have a vote about it. And anytime there's a vote, you know what stands in the way. So, all right. Well, we'll take a two-minute break. Uh, Diane Feinstein will fix the whole situation, and then we'll be back. Easy. Uh, all right. Got to go arrest some uh, espionage suspects. Be right back. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Okay, welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, I don't have any um, classified material to leak, so I guess we should just do another story. Right. Well, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, who is threatening to pardon a mm. really bad actor who was convicted of murder. Uh, yeah, a, a murderer. A murderer. I mean, I guess that's it. Um the thing is, as Ryan uh, Autella points out on Twitter, keep in mind, Greg Abbott is a former justice on the Texas Supreme Court. I, I don't think I even knew that. Absolutely remarkable that he requested a pardon mm. for Daniel Perry without reviewing any evidence. Eh, but he didn't really evidence. request. He requested Shmavidence. a pardon. He didn't give a pardon. Yeah, right. That's uh, a... Because the way it works, I guess, in Texas, as it was explained to me, is uh, you need a pardon board to recommend it. Yeah, they do have that. Uh, I, it reminds me every once in a while that uh, they describe the model there in Texas as a weak governor model, which, you know, I don't, like, why would you ever adopt some a weak anything? But they do yeah, because, have that. Uh, Greg Perry, who is uh, threatening to uh, pardon a murderer, Abbott. is only uh, Greg Abbott uh, uh, the uh, Perry. to pardon a murderer <laughs> named Daniel Perry is yeah. only the second worst person in Texas. The worst is the lieutenant governor. Yeah, and uh, Patrick, but, uh, and and I always understood that they said, well, the lieutenant governor has more power than the governor because they I call don't the know sessions. what they are. They, they ah, schedule okay. the legislature. The okay, um, but yes, apparently, uh, I guess Greg Abbott figured he could get a freebie with the MAGA base by saying, "Oh, I'll pardon him. I'll pardon him if they, if, you know, if the pardon board plays ball and gives me one." And uh, probably knowing that the pardon board, it, who knows how that's comprised, but. Uh, they probably take their job seriously and wouldn't do it. Although, you know, I don't know. Maybe they're lunatics. I guess that's possible, too. 
So uh, a a, a fellow named Sawyer Hackett put together on Is that Twitter a, real name? Uh, a whole bunch of things, uh, some of which appears to be missing at the moment. It's been removed, Ooh. but he was writing about uh, some of the things that uh, this fellow Daniel Perry had said. Oh, yes. in public. Hmm. Uh, a Quite lot of it uh, doesn't way. seem to be look all, looking all that good, but I'm not going to go into it because that page seems to be missing. So let's just uh, assume that there's reasons for the page missing. But okay. the whole idea and what uh, uh, Abbott is doing, you know, you really have to wonder why sometimes. Like, what's the point? I understand why uh, mm. Governor Scott Perry of Florida does uh. all the performative stuff. He's running for president. To fail yes. like Scott Walker did. But, I you know, understand. I understand why he's doing it. I don't understand why Greg Abbott is doing it. He's not running. Uh, isn't he? I don't know. I don't think so. Oh. Uh, you know, uh, there's no money for him. There's no uh, publicity for him. There's nothing in it for mm -hmm. him. He's not going to out MAGA both Ron DeSantis and Donald Trump. I mean, it doesn't sound likely. He hasn't put together, I'm uh, running, everybody knows I'm running, here's my book tour stuff. Yeah, he has. I just I don't get why he's doing it because you know there's not all that much future in it, but you know he's doing it. Uh, yeah, hmm. Well, he may not know what else to do with his life. Maybe I don't know. He's okay. Well, that's in, weird. In any case, there it is. Uh, but uh, you know that's that's pretty much it for lightning round stuff. I, I want to mm. get into what's going on in Florida. Ron DeSantis signs a Florida bill banning abortion after six weeks of pres of uh, pregnancy. Hmm. Uh, oh, last night, that's probably a, yeah. I'll ban abortion after six weeks of my presidency. Yeah. Probably the measure cuts too. off what has become a critical access point for abortion care in the South since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. Hmm. Now that'll go to the Florida Supreme Court because it's probably against the law based on the Florida Constitution. But oh. the Florida Supreme Court is Who like cares? the Fifth Circuit, so I don't expect them to do anything good. Hmm. Nonetheless, it's there. The implication though, in terms of a longer term uh, situation politically, well, here's a Politico. DeSantis could be walking into a general election trap on abortion. The Florida governor signs a six week abortion ban that could hurt his White House aspirations. And here's the basic theme. Everything that the Republicans do to help them with the base hurts them in the general election. Mm -hmm. It's true for Trump. It's true right. for DeSantis. DeSantis is banking on support in the primary from anti-abortion voters, particularly those angry at Donald Trump. The former president faced a backlash from some conservatives when he complained that the party's far right position on abortion hurt the GOP in last year's midterm election. Now, that happened right after the midterm election. We talked about that. That was Tim Alberta's story about how Trump is losing uh, strength with evangelical voters. Mm. And it's true. And I'll have more about that today from a different source, uh, what Trump is not losing is evangelical pastors. Okay. Because the pastors know Wait. they don't have anywhere else to go. Okay. They're stuck. They're, they're, they're boxed in. They've supported him. They, you can't say this is God's choice. Oh, this week it isn't. <laughs> That's just strange you know, they can't and mysterious ways. The voters, I mean, yeah, you strange can do whatever and mysterious you want. ways indeed. Uh, but the voters can do whatever they want. And the problem that Trump is having with evangelicals is a what have you done for me lately situation. Yeah, it's true. Hmm. You got us all these judges. They did what they did. We got rid of Roe. Congratulations. Clap, 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 clap. Great. Now what? I don't know. All these other states are doing things like uh, uh, medical abortions. That's the most popular way to do things in this country anyway. We want it banned everywhere, and we want it banned without exception. Are you with us? And Trump says, well, that's going to lose me the election. That's a And evangelicals say, well, are you with us? And Trump says, you didn't hear even me. Republicans <laughs> don't want me to do this. And um, evangelicals say, are you with us? And Trump says, um, 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 uh, you know, like Tim Scott. Uh, Tim Scott was asked about oh. what his position on abortion was. And he said, well, you know, this and that and everything else. And well, but. He you didn't know, know they I, were going to ask. They're all like that. They're all like, uh, Tony Gonzalez, uh, Republican in Texas. Uh, Republican congressman. I thought he was a uh, tight end. Why do you keep talking about abortion? You know, women care about a whole lot of other things too. Why don't we talk about those? Well, because <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> sure, because it's like it's a really salient issue right now when your party's getting killed on it. And we want to ask you about it. Well, I don't want to talk about it. Mm. You know, All so right. uh, that's what Trump is having trouble with, with the evangelicals. And of course, he can't afford to lose anybody because he's already lost an election. And if he loses rather than gains voters, he'll just lose even bigger. I guess so. So he's got a problem. So the six-week ban pushes the outer boundary of anti-abortion rights, and it could spell trouble for DeSantis among independents and suburban voters in a general election if he makes it that far. Mm-hmm. We're going to make him own this in his agenda everywhere he goes, said a National Democratic operative granted anonymity to discuss the obvious. Not to discuss party strategy, I'm sorry. <laughs> goes to Michigan, abortion ban. Goes to Ohio, abortion ban. Yeah. And that'll take different forms. We'll hang this incredibly toxic abortion ban and his agenda around his neck with different tactics. That's what the Democrats will do. And yes, I know out there people will complain. Democrats don't fight hard enough and this, that and everything else. Watch what's going on here. Hmm. Look at Wisconsin. Look at Kansas. Yeah. Well, don't, mm. don't give me that Democrats don't fight. Don't give me that uh, Democrats don't stand up. This is exactly what's happening. The operative added that this is one of many points from which to attack DeSantis, who's taken several stances on social issues Democrats believe won't sit well with swing voters. Democrats have not, since the midterms, and during the midterms and since the midterms, have not stepped back and said, well, let's ignore the abortion issue. Let's talk about kitchen table issues. That's what Republicans People, are saying. Uh, yeah, And there were Democrats who said we should do that. And they did uh, not do and, that. And as the uh, midterm came closer and they realized that Dobbs happened, they yeah. stopped doing that. Uh, well, good. Because it was dumb. It was dumb. And so the whole concept here, and, and we've talked about this, is voting rights. Voting rights is popular, but not a... Uh, an issue that motivates white voters because they got rights because they already got rights. They already have privilege. Okay. But what you do is you say, it's not just voting rights. It's the freedom to vote the way you want to. It's a freedom issue. And you wrap everything into bigger issues. You know, it's not just Mm -hmm. voting rights is that they want to take this away from you. Yeah. You wrap it into bigger issues in order to get a bigger audience listening. Abortion is a freedom issue. You are taking away your right to choose. Mm -hmm. Pro-choice means something. You didn't think it meant something until it was taken away from you. Now that it's taken away from you, you get what it means? And people say, yeah, I do. And it turns out in just about every single state, whether it's a red state or a blue state, the majority of people, not just Democrats, certainly independents and Democrats, but, you know, in many cases, Republicans. Mm-hmm. don't want everything taken away it's a freedom issue you make it a freedom issue you're going to win all right and that's why desantis is self. running into a trap here's another one why desantis should take a pass on the 2024 presidential election by bill Schur oh all in, right uh, washington monthly the idea that the florida yeah, governor could clinch listen. the gop nomination by running as a competent no drama donald trump is fundamentally flawed uh, he's not doing it this week Politico's Florida correspondent Gary Feinhout reported a rumbling that Governor DeSantis isn't ready to run for president and may wait things out, but in all likelihood remains on the path. Why? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people in Florida, in the Florida delegation, aren't supporting him. He's getting really Ah, upset because some of them are are supporting Trump. He was going to try and force them to do so. I so uh, Bill Scher says DeSantis should heed the rumblings. The second term hmm. Republican released his book, The Courage to be Free. You get that? Freedom? <laughs> Freedom is part of what they do. What a, That's why taking what it away from them is so scary to them. Yeah. Okay. On February 28th and embarked on a national book tour with the obvious intent to stir public interest in a presidential bid. It appeared successful no with plenty of news coverage, oh, but everything on. that's happened since – including DeSantis' backtracking on his Ukraine is not a strategic interest comment, Disney outfoxing him, Donald Trump's indictment has overshadowed the book and shrunken the 44-year-old stature. And the proof is in the polls. Since the book launch, the Real Clear Politics average of Republican presidential primary polls shows Trump's margin over DeSantis widening from 16 to 27 points. No the way. arguments we're getting in are seemingly straightforward. One is don't end up like Chris Christie. Ah, Okay, yeah. marginalized and 
Christie was a gleefully oh. pugnacious chief executive sworn by national budge, but not having completed a single term, Christie concluded he wasn't ready for the presidency by the time he did run. Conservative hardliners had grown skeptical of his ideological bearings and flocked to an even more gleefully pugnacious Northeasterner, mm. and so Christie lost out. DeSantis has reason to worry. If he waits, he'll be old news by 2028. All right. That's Another reason to run, even if there's a significant risk of losing, is that a valiant defeat in a Republican primary can help her in the poll position later. Think Bob Dole. Think, uh, you know, Ronald Reagan. Uh, think uh, John McCain, you know, so uh, in other words, Democrats usually look for a new face and Republicans don't mind going to somebody who almost won but didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay. Didn't didn't Mitt Romney do that too? I Uh, I don't know. He could have. I can't remember what he did in eight, but okay. Oh, eight. Back in aught eight. Uh, Well, uh, Bush beat Romney in 2008. Okay. So yeah, Romney did it. it too. Okay. So it's a thing that Republicans do. There so uh, DeSantis's claims of putting points on the board was undercut oh, when Disney it. took some points off. And the ultimate question is whether the GOP is Trump's GOP. And the, and the answer is it is. And that's basically why he shouldn't run. OK. All right. Well, uh, by the way, before I thought you were going to say not that the proof was in the polls, but that the proof was in the pudding because I was reminded of uh, Ron well, his fingers are weird. In the pudding. Yeah. Exactly. No, the, the proof, proof is, is in the poll. That's why he was putting, the you know, the proof is in the pudding. Oh, really? That's why I'm sticking my hand in here. To, I'm trying to find the proof. And then I'm just licking my hands clean. This is right. a deeply weird thing about him. <laughs> now, Matthew Isabel, by the way, okay. getting back to Florida, points mm. out that every single time abortion has been on the ballot, yes. abortion wins. Right. Uh, establish a constitutional right of privacy, 1980. Yes, 60, no, 39. That's why... Uh, you can bring what DeSantis did to Florida court and say, there's a constitutional right to privacy. You can't do this. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're looking at the law, and I'm not a lawyer, as you know, uh, because I keep reminding you I'm not a lawyer, uh, you'd look at the law and say, well, this is a no-brainer. Of course, uh, you know, this is illegal. It's unconstitutional by the Florida Constitution. However, who cares? uh, Exactly. First of all, uh, well, second of all, the Supreme mm-hmm. Court ruled since then. And first of all, who cares? Because it's Florida and the Florida S- Supreme Court could do whatever they want. Yeah. Because that's what courts do. So I'm not uh, confident that uh, they'll win that case. But nonetheless, um, so uh, Amendment 1 in 2004 requires a minor's parent or guardian to be notified before an abortion. Yes, 64, no, 35. So parental involvement, yes. Mm-hmm. But uh, in 2012, there was a referendum. Uh, the proposed amendment provides that public funds may not be expended for any abortion, uh, but it had two components. One provision codified into state law, what federal law already did, which is that public funds can't go there. And the second provision aimed to specifically separate abortion from the right to privacy. If passed, this would have meant the only thing preventing a ban on abortion would be Roe v. Wade, and uh, the measure failed. Didn't okay. even get 50%. Hmm. And then 60% was needed for passage. So the right to privacy is still linked with abortion. And so, you know, there, there's a chance. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, are you saying there's a chance? Uh, it requires not really. a MAGA uh, movement, an anti-privacy movement among the MAGA troops. Which See, it's a path I guess they could do almost anything. But, okay. Like you just said. So we're getting killed on abortion. This is in Rolling Stone. Inside Trump's secret meetings with the religious right, the ex-president expects anti-abortion activists to line up behind his presidential campaign, but his bid for their support is off to a rocky start. Hmm. He's not the only Republican candidate caught between hardcore supporters demanding new curbs and a majority of voters who continue to reject an anti-abortion agenda. Rolling Stone spoke to half a dozen longtime GOP strategists working on races for next year, almost all of whom say they're advising their candidates to talk as little as possible about GOP abortion proposals. And party (laughs) operatives are hoping anti-abortion voters won't notice and won't care. Sure. Me too. Yeah, right. Uh, What a country. I mean, you really make a living giving out bad advice like this? 
Yes, and I thought you had said that they, so you were talking to a bunch of operatives working on racists for 2024, and they are. Well, they are. In many cases. But that's but, not what I said. Yeah, right. Okay, just to be sure. Uh, yeah, well, uh, good luck with that one. Um, you know, it's only like a 50-year tradition of uh, making abortion central to Republican campaigns, but this year, no one can talk about it. Okay. I'm sure they'll listen Fox to Fox News asked Tim Scott if he's officially running for president. He launches into his well-rehearsed talking points, which was announcing at Fort Sumter, because what kind of symbolism is that? Hmm. And then they cut him off because they got the video of the Pentagon's leakers arrest. So <laughs> thank you, Tim Scott. Okay. And then while they're doing that, it was a one word uh, answer. somebody asked him about his position on abortion, and he gives them a word salad. It's a yes or no question. <laughs> I didn't know they were going to ask me about abortion. Would you support a federal ban on abortions? Tim Scott, I would simply say the fact of the matter oh. is when you look at the issue, one of the challenges we have, <laughs> we continue to go to the most restrictive conversations. What? And Stuart Stevens says, you know, as a campaign staffer, you can't prepare your guy for every oddball question. I mean, who would have thought Tim Scott would get asked about abortion? That's crazy. Tiny That's American nuts. flags for some. Yeah, okay, well, uh, I don't know why he wasn't ready for that, but maybe it's because he's not ready for running for president. Well, that's another thing. By the way, uh, this is a though. new Franklin and Marshall poll of Pennsylvania Great. released today, which is yesterday. Mm -hmm. Democrats have a 28-point advantage on abortion, which is higher than Social Security and Medicare. Oh, all right. In 2009, 2010, the number of PA residents who thought abortion illegal in all circumstances was 22 to 24 percent. Mm -hmm. 2009, 2010, since Dobbs, 8 yeah. to 9 percent. OK, what? I'm not sure what that. Uh, that's the percentage of voters who. What? You think abortion think, should be illegal think in all circumstances. Okay, should be. Okay. All right. Yeah. Went from 22 huh. to 24% in 2010 to now it's only 8 to 9% of Pennsylvanians. Think that. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they, and they love to cling Freedom, to God man. and guns. I mean, you're going to try to take uh, the right to choose away from them that mm. they used to have and now you don't. We talked about that in the abstract. And it's Democrats' job to tie every issue to freedom and choice. All right. And not just make it a, uh, you know, pro-choice or protect the fetus sort of question, hmm. which right. they call the unborn. Yes, right. That's the you... language they want. That's the framing they want. No, right. it's a freedom issue. Yeah. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, you may never need one, but why do you want to give away the right to have one? If you need it, if you want it, if something happens and you, someone you know, wants to have it, and the answer from Republicans is, we don't care, we say no. We're in the business of saying no to you and the people you love for anything you want. That's Now, a, this is bad not just my opinion that abortion is terrifying Republicans. I know abortion is terrifying Republicans because of this Rich Lowry piece in Politico magazine, which is entitled, Abortion is Terrifying Republicans. Uh -huh. They're seeing terror sparkles. Here's how they can escape the political spiral. Sure. Here's Republicans at the Lowry. national level right now are scared. You can hear it in their silence on the issue of abortion after a district judge in Texas struck down the FDA approval of the abortion pill, Mifepristone. That decision also came immediately after Republicans lost a key race for a Supreme Court seat in Wisconsin to a progressive jurist who ran to a large extent on abortion rights. You could say the Republican fight or flight instinct is kicking in, except it's none of the former and all of the latter. Of course, he thinks that's a terrible idea. Republicans have to buck up. And what they really need to do you is get a hold the of themselves, up. stop being afraid and start lying about the issue. Okay, I guess so. Well, that's great advice. Uh, Republicans are terrified about this, and my advice is to them, don't be terrified of it. Oh, you see, well, he explains cured. the Michigan and Done. Wisconsin disasters stemmed from statutes that nobody would have written in the post-op environment. Michigan had a 1931 law still on the books. Wisconsin stated from 1849. Mm -hmm. These complete bans with narrow exceptions, went too far for these purple or blue states and Republicans were inevitably going to get hurt by their association with them. Yeah. Right? Same thing in Kansas. Republicans should be pushing for restrictions that go as far as the state's voters are willing to accept and no farther. So he wants to get behind things like Lindsey Graham's 15-week ban mm -hmm. and stop saying there's no exceptions for uh, 
anything, including the life of the mother. Mm -hmm. He thinks if Republicans do that, avoid the issue otherwise, and then lie about everything else, somehow the issue will go away. That's his point. Okay. And so Republicans shouldn't be scared because we can do this. Uh, we need to neutralize <laughs> the Democratic political advantage on the issue and fight it to a draw, that. he says. If this is unsatisfying, discomforting, it's better than the pre-Dobbs context when the politics are easier, but it was impossible to get anything done. Fear, okay. no matter how natural or visceral, is no substitute for careful thought and considered action. That's his perspective from a conservative point of view. And Henry Olson, writing in The Washington Worthless. Post, abortion is not the magic bullet that Democrats think it is. And his point is that Dan Kelly lost in Wisconsin, not because of the abortion issue, but because Dan Kelly sucks. I say. I say, why not both? Yeah, right. One of the things that makes you suck is your abortion Again, position. it's a freedom issue. Yep. And they don't get it and they don't see it, but they are okay. worried. They know to be worried. They know to be scared. It's not us saying that they are scared. It's them saying that they're scared. They mm. get it. They understand why. Again, at its core, they think this is a losing issue for them. And what they're really afraid of is that you're going to turn it into a freedom issue and make it an even bigger issue because they want to neutralize it. They want to make it go away. They want to talk about something else. They want to come up with some solution that will allow them to run on this and the problem is, as with uh, Donald Trump's problem with the evangelical base, is they will not be allowed to do that. They will not be permitted to do that. That's not what Nor their voters want. Be. If they do it, they'll lose the evangelicals. Yeah. Uh, what's great is there, it's a self-enforcing thing. So they're in a position. So it's a no win position we have for them. It. And I'm here for that. <laughs> yeah, I'll be, I'll be right next to you watching. Uh, yeah. Well... It's interesting, this idea, oh, well, we need to go back to these other uh, restrictions that the major and go no further than the, the population will allow. But as we saw in Florida, one, they don't one, want restrictions. Yeah. and How are you, uh, you going to do that? And your voters, your most loyal voters, actually say they do want the restrictions. So they I'm not sure how you're going to settle they want on that. the most restrictive thing we can possibly even think of. But, not the one that can possibly pass. Yeah. We want the most restriction we could possibly think of because That's we're right. religious zealots. And you need to do what we say. You should be banned from thinking about abortion before you get pregnant. That's what we want. So, mm. yeah, I don't know. And this idea that, oh, well, the 15-week thing that uh, Larry throws out. You guys were at that position 20 years ago, and it was never good enough for you. Your whole you know, reason for being as a party was to push to get rid of those and, and shorten those restrictions. It was always your playbook. And now everyone knows it because one, you said that was your playbook. Two, you went ahead and did it. That's why this huge backlash against you. No one can ever believe Republicans when they say things like, well, well, we want a more reasonable restrictions. We will bring back the exceptions for uh, rape, incest and life for the mother. Everyone knows that was a talking point. It rolls right out of your mouth because they repeated it so often and they always said that was their position. And then other people said, no, they're going to become more extreme. Uh, their, their base is going to push it and we're not going to be able to resist it. Neither are they. And eventually you're going to find Roe v. Wade overturned and here we are. And now you can never believe them about it ever again. Right. And, and everyone again, knows they, it, you know, they basically openly talk about the fact that they're getting clobbered on this, they're losing, they're scared, and we have to figure out better ways of lying. Yeah. That, that's, that's basically right. their position. That's it. That has to be. Because there's no sense in stating what their actual position is. They'll lose. Mm. With their own ba – they, you can't even win your primary with whatever lie it is you're about to tell. Right. Now, Ian Milheiser sums up where we're at. Uh, Judge Thomas Rice in Washington, you may recall, had a dueling opinion – with uh, Matthew Kaczmarek of Texas, the except Kaczmarek did it for the whole country. And uh, Thomas Rice in Washington only did it for the 17 states in D.C. that's under his uh, supervision because he's a more prudent judge. Yes. So there were these dueling concepts. And then the D.C. Fifth Circuit came and said, well, we'll suspend the seven day rule. But for the most part, we'll keep the ban on uh, mail in uh, mephipristone. Until we get together and do this, it was a three judge panel and yeah, one judge said, that's ridiculous. Just get rid of the whole stupid Kaczmarek ruling. It's awful. But the two Trump judges said, no, no, we'll keep parts of it. Hmm. That happened. And then Thomas Rice looked at it and said, OK, I'm issuing a new order. 
Ignore the Fifth Circuit. Yeah, well, you can. He's not For in the Fifth Circuit. you who are under me, the 17 states in D.C., completely ignore anything they say. They're idiots. That's not All what right. he said. What he said is, irrespective oh. of the Fifth Circuit's decision, do this. And as sure, in, Ian Milheiser points out, this is really smart because my read on this is that Judge Rice understands that the Supreme Court is likely to sit on the case. It's Alito's uh, purview to, to send it to the others hmm. uh, because he's over the Fifth Circuit, who is over Kaczmarek. Right. My read on this is that Judge Rice yeah. understands that SCOTUS is likely to sit on this case for as long as possible to keep the Fifth Circuit's order in place. But Rice's order makes it tough for the GOP justices to do that because Department of Justice and FDA are in the position of which one are we supposed to follow? Mm-hmm. Rice said do this, but Fifth Circuit do that. And I don't know. And we got to ask the Supreme Court to settle this. And you can't ignore it. And you can't sit on it. And you can't wait for two years from now. You have to settle this today because we don't know what to do tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. That's what Rice did. And it was smart. And then we'll see what happens. And okay. the thing is, we have so many pharmacy, hmm. big pharma uh, representatives so weighing on the fact you can't do this. This destroys our entire business model. Yes. That you think some of the conservative justices on the Supreme Court might agree with that. So we'll see. It is possible. Uh, is the Millheiser thing in the in the uh, roundup? Who knows? I don't know. I'd love I to think see it that. is. I'll take a look. But I'm uh, pretty sure it is, but I'll give it to you again. Yeah, send it along so I can be sure. I, I'd like to read that one. That's an interesting one, and that's one of the things that uh, the splits in the circuits, That's well, that's one of the things that usually is a ticket to – a hearing at the Supreme Court, but I mean, Bill Heiser is a reporter with a JD, by the way. Okay, just for those of you who don't know, because yes. again, I I never pretend I'm a lawyer. I really, uh, despite David's kind words, really don't understand three quarters of this stuff. Mm. I know the practical aspect of it, but yeah. I don't understand why it's an issue in the first place. Because you know, lawyers. Well, maybe uh, I'll take a look. I'd be interested in seeing whether there's more we should read from this one to help explain it. But yeah, I mean, if you're not in the Fifth Circuit. Uh, there's no reason to adhere to Fifth Circuit uh, 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 precedent. You, you can you can do that. That's your prerogative. All right, we'll be back on Monday. Thanks, Greg. All right, welcome back now to the Kegro in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Coming back in at a weird time because uh, I started the music too late, but I think uh, we timed the break correctly. I was sort of interested in doubling back on the Ian Milheiser input here just because I want to like kind of clarify where things stand and why uh, Judge Rice is able to do what he wants to do. You know, for people who don't uh, deal with the courts all the time, uh, you might say, well, I don't understand how, you know, what do you do if someone in the Fifth Circuit, if, or rather if a panel, a three-judge panel, as they usually use, on the Fifth Circuit says this is the state of the law as we see it, even though Kaczmarek has issued a nationwide, uh, whatever the hell it was, that he, I don't know whether he's, uh, but, but but he, he, he was it a, well, I don't know whether he's banning things or uh, I forget exactly what the the stance of the uh, the ruling is, but he claims to speak, you know, for the federal judiciary nationwide, and yeah, you know, he's got a certain amount of power to do that. But if there's a conflicting precedent and a conflicting finding, which is very important, from a different circuit, the uh, and and uh, you know, if that or from a different, well, it's a different district court in a different circuit. Uh, the circuit court in Washington overseeing uh, the work in, in Washington can say, uh, well, the law, the state of the law is different here in this circuit. And there can be an entire collection of states under that circuit that just operate with the opposite as its law, despite the fact that Kazmarek says, I speak for everyone everywhere, I'm issuing a nationwide uh, ban. You know, other circuits can say, uh, you really, don't, you know, be gone. You have no power here. You can speak for your area, the, uh, the uh, northern district of Texas, and the Fifth Circuit has their, is its prerogative saying that you speak for the Fifth Circuit so that in Texas and Louisiana and I forget wherever else is under the Fifth Circuit, uh, you can say, all right, well, the, 
the the state of the law is the Fifth Circuit Court agrees that this nationwide ban should be in effect. And even though other circuits disagree with the nationwide ban, it's at least the state of the law currently here in the Fifth Circuit. And and that's why Supreme Courts have to or usually choose to step in when there is a conflict among the circuits, because then you're saying, well, n- now uh, different pe- people have different rights depending on where they live in the United States. Uh, and when it's a matter of federal rights, we want to have, uh, you know, some they to the extent they still believe in equal protection under the federal law. You want to settle these conflicts so that everybody has the same, can expect the same federal rights anyway, wherever they may be in the United States, even if the states want to abrogate those rights uh, themselves. But anyway, so let's see. Uh, Milheiser saying uh, this is smart. Uh, he's speaking about the tweet that he has included here from Mark Joseph Stern. Why don't we read the thing that's smart and then read why he says it's smart. Mark Joseph Stern tweeting, Wow, Judge Thomas Rice issues a new order compelling the FDA to preserve access to... Ah, crap, I should have paid closer attention to his pronunciation. Uh, Mifepristone? Mifepristone? Dang it. Anyway, in this, in 17 states and D.C., without any of the old obstacles irrespective of the Fifth Circuit's decision. We have a direct conflict, and let's see, then there's a thread that goes with it. Uh, Some two screen grabs here. Let's see. Here's the one in which Judge Rice says, irrespective of the Northern District of Texas ruling or the Fifth Circuit's anticipated ruling. And uh, let's see. The other screen cap doesn't tell us that much more. So let's jump out of those pictures and go on with the rest of the thread here. Judge Rice includes a lengthy criticism of forum shopping. That's well worth doing. And nationwide injunctions that's clearly directed at Matthew Kaczmarek, the Texas judge who's purported to, quote, suspend FDA approval of Mifepristone. Dang it. I mean... We had a doctor on who pronounced it and everything, and I tried to pay attention to it, but all right. Well, the Fifth Circuit's decision was clearly designed to reshape Kazmarek's screed into a more coherent and plausible argument that might persuade Kavanaugh and Barrett to vote against emergency relief. But now the Supreme Court simply has to act. The FDA is facing competing orders. I know conservatives will smear Judge Rice for this, But his point is very sensible. He issued an order that applied solely to the parties before him. Kaczmarek issued an order that purported to apply nationwide. But Kaczmarek cannot boss around the parties in Judge Rice's court. And more specifically, really has no power beyond the Fifth Circuit, I would would say. Uh, The FDA now has absolutely no excuse to impose the restrictions on that stupid drug that I can't pronounce anymore, that the Fifth Circuit, now that the Fifth Circuit tried to resurrect today, okay, no excuse to impose the restrictions the Fifth Circuit tried to essentially rescue from Kaczmarek's horrible decision. Enforcement, discretion, and competing order, competing rights order equals keep the status quo. It's the only lawful response. And let's see, is this Slate article... His own, yes, it is, Mark Joseph Stern explaining that the FDA should not enforce the Fifth Circuit's indefensible abortion pill decision. By the way, so is it, what's his name, Judge Rice? What's his uh, first name? Is this in here? Will I find it in the article I already have open? Uh, hmm, uh, It's not immediately obvious, but dang it. I thought that would save me some time. Um do I feel like reading the entirety of the thing? Let's go back and see what Ian Milheiser had to say about it, saying this is smart. My read on this is that Judge Rice understands that SCOTUS is likely to sit on this case, right, as Greg read us, for as long as possible to keep the Fifth Circuit's order in place. Rice's order makes it tough for GOP GOP justices to do that. And let's see, he's also, it's Thomas Rice. Okay, thank you, Greg. Yeah, so Judge Tom, I want to kind of look him up. Uh, just to see exactly where he sits. And okay, here's, uh, so is it, shall we use Wikipedia for it? That's usually going to get it right. Let's see. So he's the, uh, in, he's the chief judge of the Eastern District of 
Washington, the state of Washington. Um, that would mean, let's see, just to get all our facts here, uh, Washington, uh, I'm curious, which judicial circuit is it that Washington State is? He's the, okay, Ninth Circuit. Okay, so that's one thing that'll tip you off. And people uh, often uh, associate the Ninth Circuit with California, that's sort of where they sit and uh, is obviously the largest and most populous state in the circuit. But, okay, so you're talking about now a conflict between the Ninth Circuit, which is exactly where you would expect, and the Fifth Circuit, which is exactly what you would expect on this question of abortion. So, but again, I mean, the way the courts kind of work, despite the fact that Kaczmarek says, well, my uh, ban is nationwide because I'm stopping the FDA from doing something, uh, it's not helpful that it's something that the FDA did 23 years ago and everybody has been depending on ever since. And that'll be uh, a large part of the argument that the pharmaceutical companies are making. You know, everybody has, uh, you know, we, we put an awful lot, we invested a lot into getting the approval. And then when we got it and we've been doing business on it on that basis for 23 years, to have one guy say, throw out this billion dollars worth of business just on the business aspect of it, never mind the you know the 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 uh, the rest of the issues tied up in it, that should be enough. Usually, it's enough for a Republican Supreme Court to say, "No, this is not something we can tolerate." Just throwing an entire business sector out the window on the whims of one guy. But on top of that, you know, like I said, it, ultimately he is one judge in the Northern District of Texas, and even though he's been mostly upheld at the Fifth Circuit level. There's uh, almost no reason, like, you know, the Fifth Circuit has jurisdiction over the states it has jurisdiction over. The, the state of Washington will have no interest in what the Fifth Circuit says, except to the extent that no one in their own circuit has ruled and that, and that the Ninth Circuit hasn't said anything. If that were the case, then at the minimum... You'd be in court and you would say, well, um, uh, you know, we think one party would say, well, we think that there's a ban on the FDA or, you know, a suspension of the FDA's approval. And the judge there would likely say, why? Why makes you think so? Well, there's been a ruling uh, by a federal judge that uh, stays the approval. And doubtless the other party would say, hey, your honor. That's true, and we included it in our brief, but as you will have seen from reading the brief, but I'll just remind you now, that's a ruling from the Amarillo Division of the Northern District of Texas only. And, you know, that's Amarillo, Texas. We're Washington. And, you know, they might then say, well, you know, we have good reason to believe, and then eventually it became true that the Fifth Circuit will uphold this ruling. To which, again, the other party in a case in Washington would say, yeah, and we're the Ninth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit, uh, th their decision is at best like advisory to you. If you have no other authority to go on and you don't feel justified in issuing your own ruling, and I think you do because uh, what's on your side? The FDA's decision, their long research into the subject 23 years ago when they first approved it, their technical and medical expertise, and 23 years of success and 23 years of dependence on that decision by the business community and the medical community. And what you have in opposition in it uh, to it is, at best, another circuit has said, well, we think that for Texas and Louisiana and what else is in the Fifth Circuit? I have to look that up so that I can uh, give you the information correctly. Uh, the Fifth Circuit is, uh, let's see, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas, right? And you say, Washington, we got nothing to do with those guys. Uh, and if you were bringing the same case in Mississippi... You could say, well, sure, uh, there's a ban, but I mean, the guy sits in the Amarillo Division of the Northern Division of Texas. That's Texas. We're Mississippi. 
and before the Fifth Circuit touches it, that would work. A judge, a federal judge in Mississippi may very well, I don't know why they, he would be appointed to the bench in Mississippi, but he, it could have happened. And a judge would say, that, that's Texas. This is Mississippi. We think differently. And, you know, it's unlikely to happen. Uh, or, you know, he could certainly analogize to it if he opted to go in the other direction. And you can say, well, that judge is in Texas and ruling on parties in Texas. But he does purport to say that the ban should be nationwide. And, uh, well, we don't have anything to go on here in terms of precedent in Mississippi. But we can analogize to the Texas situation and say, uh, we'll agree. You're allowed to make that analogy. But you're also allowed to say, that doesn't really apply here. This is for a different case in a different state. But if the Fifth Circuit says, nah, he's pretty much got it right, what that means for the time being is, okay, now a federal judge in Mississippi has to say, I disagree, but that's the law in the Fifth Circuit as far as I know. Uh, you know, I wish it were different, uh, but I'm going to have to go along with the Fifth Circuit here. Before the Fifth Circuit rules, you're allowed to say, eh, I don't know, that doesn't really make any sense to me. And then it would be the job of the Fifth Circuit to settle the dispute as between uh, the different district courts that they oversee. So in Mississippi, that would make a difference, Fifth Circuit ruling. But in Washington, they could just say, nah, that are we Mississippi? Are we Texas? Are we Louisiana? We are not. We are Washington. And more than that, we sit in the Ninth Circuit. More than that, the Ninth Circuit is very unlikely to agree with the Fifth Circuit on this one. So we, I think, can reasonably anticipate having the weight of our circuit behind us saying, like, right now, we're arguably in a weaker position. Uh, if Judge Rice were to say, well, as far as the, where does he sit? The, uh, hmm, Eastern District of Washington is concerned. We also have no existing precedent on this. You might point to the Fifth Circuit Court and say, well, that is a circuit court. You know, they, they do have a certain amount of weight, more than we would give to a district court. And we're a district court. Does that mean we go with them? Mm, well, we also, I'm the chief judge of the Eastern District of Washington. I have a pretty good idea where the Ninth Circuit is going to be on this. And I'm willing to go ahead and rule it this way, the other direction, uh, in the belief that the Ninth Circuit will uphold that. Because the Ninth Circuit certainly isn't going to look at the Fifth Circuit and say, well, we're stuck. The Fifth Circuit said this. Uh, they're circuit judges. Well, we're circuit judges. We can come up with a completely different ruling, and we probably will. And then it's not our job, but it's the job of the Supreme Court to say, okay, now, we have one circuit saying this and one circuit saying that. We'll settle which one is correct. Or they could say, eh, to hell with it. We're going to let this conflict lie there. I don't really know. You know. It's supposed to be their objective to settle these disputes. But they could just say, to hell with you. We're not going to because politics. I mean, that option is out there. Uh, maybe at this point, we should give a quick look to uh, Mark Joseph. It was Mark Joseph Stern, right? Yeah, his piece in Slate, just to see if it's any more coherent. And then Greg has added a couple other pieces that we might, uh, pieces of the puzzle we might fit in here. The FDA should not enforce the Fifth Circuit's indefensible abortion pill decision, he's saying. And it's not just, you know, as I understand it, it's not just him saying, well, that decision sucks. Let's not do it. There's a real legal argument here. The agency has no obligation to impose the court's orders and doctors have no duty to follow them. Let's see why he says so. Uh, first, a little dramatic scene setting. Early Thursday morning, the Fifth Circuit, Fifth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals partially vindicated Judge Matthew Kazmarek's lawless and unprecedented decision. You can't really vindicate that. You can uphold it, but it can't really be vindicated. Attempting to cut off access to, oh boy, uh, Mifepristone. And uh, Scott has sent me a uh, um, a note here with a link to a pronunciation guide. Uh, is it does it speak it out loud or does it give me some sort of written thing? If it speaks it out loud, I guess I could play it off of my phone 
and see if the microphone picks it up and see if we can then imitate it correctly. Let's see. Oh, uh, here's a voice being pronounced by a male from the United States. Let's. Uh, why a male? All right. Well. Mifepristone. And I'm sure that's what Greg said before. Did everybody hear that? Uh, where does it play? Mifepristone. Uh, he's whispering it. Okay. Mifepristone. All right. Let's see if we can work that into conversation. Thank you, Scott. All right. Where were we? Why did we have to say that? Ah, yes, right. The, unpre the uh, unprecedented decision attempting to cut off access to Mifepristone. Keep wanting to say Prestone, the antifreeze. This is, of course, though, the first drug in a medication abortion. And let's see, even the Fifth Circuit could not defend Kazmarek's attempt to revoke the FDA's approval of the drug, which it granted in the year 2000. But the appeals court agreed with him on nearly everything else, imperiling access to abortion in blue states. Thursday's decision, if enforced to the letter, would radically reduce access to the medication and put abortion providers under serious threat of federal prosecution under the Comstock Act. Is that Barbara Comstock? Thanks a lot, Barbara. Anyway, the FDA, however, has no legal obligation to enforce this ruling for two reasons. First and most importantly, the agency has vast discretion not to enforce ostensible violations of the law, it can and should simply say that it will not penalize providers who defy the Fifth Circuit's decision and providers should follow the FDA's guidance, not the Fifth Circuit's. Second, the FDA is under a competing court order to preserve access to Mifepristone in 17 blue states and the District of Columbia. Hmm. Um, and, I mean, seven... I, I'm looking for an explanation of exactly why it's 17 states and D.C. exactly, but uh, that escapes me at the moment. At a bare minimum, the agency should acknowledge that it must pick one order over another. And the choice should be clear. The competing order more explicitly obligates the agency to maintain Mifepristone access in most states where abortion remains legal. And maybe that's it. Uh that there, you know, the order specifically addresses keeping access uh, so long as state law currently supports it and that there are 17 states and they all happen to be blue states uh, where that's the case. Maybe that's it. Because the Fifth Circuit largely adopts Kazmarek's off the wall theory of standing. We could spend a whole day on that. And because that theory has already been dismantled by experts here in linked. There is no need to dwell on the profound wrongness of the court's reasoning. The case really should have stopped with a straightforward explanation of why these plaintiffs, a group of anti-abortion doctors, have no standing to challenge Mifepristone in court. They say they are injured because they might treat a future patient who is prescribed Mifepristone by someone else. You see, that's like really not good enough for standing. This speculation is not nearly enough to give the plaintiffs standing, but they got lucky. The randomly assigned Fifth Circuit panel included Andrew Oldham and Kurt Engelhart, two of the most extreme Donald Trump appointees in the entire federal judiciary. The third, Katharina Hayes, is a more moderate George W. Bush appointee who would have stayed Kazmarek's whole decision. Also, the other two are dudes, and she's not. The ruling was obviously written by Oldham, as it bears all the judge's rhetorical trademarks. These plaintiffs really could not have hoped for a more favorable judge to adjudicate their case. Oldham agreed with Kazmarek that the doctors have standing because they assert that they have devoted significant time and resources to caring for women experiencing Mifepristone's harmful effects, and because of the, quote, enormous stress and pressure physicians face in the emotionally taxing work of treating these women. But are they? I don't know. And he held that the doctor's anti-abortion organization has standing because the FDA's actions have frustrated their organizational efforts to educate their members and the public on the effects of Mifepristone. But apparently it hasn't because they've managed to form an organization despite the fact that this drug has been approved for 23 years. So what's the problem? Anyway, the only novel feature of the Fifth Circuit's analysis is that the court admits that the six-year statute of limitations for challenging such an agency action bars an attack on the original approval 
of the drug in 2000. So instead, the appeals court suspends every FDA approval related to the drug since 2016. Those approvals reduced medication abortion patients' required trips to the doctor from three to one and then to zero by allowing mifepristone to be mailed allowed a generic version of the drug to be manufactured, thereby lowering costs, increased the period of pregnancy wherein mifepristone can be prescribed from 50 days to 70, allowed medical providers other than the doctor to prescribe the medication, and eliminated reporting requirements of certain adverse reactions because 16 years of reporting had proved the drug was safe. The Fifth Circuit grants the plaintiffs standing to challenge all those changes because, it asserts, the approvals made the risk of mifepristone's complications even higher. That analysis extends Kazmarek's already absurd logic to the point of parity. Uh, a little complicated, but it actually explains some of the real nuance there. Having leapt that hurdle, the Fifth Circuit spends less than three pages explaining why the FDA's gradual reduction of limits on mifepristone were illegal. It agrees with Kazmarek that the agency should not have eliminated mandatory reporting of certain adverse, adverse effects, even though the FDA explained that 16 years of reporting proved the drug was extraordinarily safe and effective. It's safer than Tylenol, Viagra, insulin, and most antibiotics, as it happens. This move, the court says, renders everything the FDA did around mifepristone from 2016 onward unlawful. You see what they've done here? I mean, that's a really interesting thing. They wanted to overturn all of it, but because there's a six-year statute of limitations to bring the kind of case that Kazmarek thought he was deciding, they said, no, you can't go back retroactively to 2000. You can only go six years or less back from today and just say, all right, all decisions made by the FDA regarding mifepristone from Six, that six-year window are invalidated, but everything else has to stand. You know, it's a partial victory, I guess, for them, but it, it just goes to show what a weird bunch of, yeah, they think they're, I don't know, uh, paying lip service to, uh, at least to the statute of limitations. They couldn't think of a way around that one for some reason. God told us to is probably all it'll take. Anyway, so it orders the agency to bring back all the drug's bygone restrictions. Although the decision is rather sloppy and vague in nullifying every FDA action after 2016, the court also appears to overrule the 2019 approval of a generic version. There is, of course, no evidence the generic version is more dangerous than the brand name. Then comes the coup de grace. The court finds that overruling the FDA is especially justified because the Comstock Act, I guess not Barbara Comstock, but a previous Comstock jerk ass, ostensibly outlawed the mailing of medication abortion. This notorious, it wasn't notorious to me, 1873 law, even Barbara wasn't around then, was designed to preserve traditional sexual morality, whatever that might be, by giving the government sweeping powers to censor the mail. Huh. The act is so impossibly broad that federal courts have consistently interpreted it to encompass only acts that are intended to produce an illegal result. But the Fifth Circuit strongly suggests that's wrong and that the law criminalizes all carriage in interstate commerce of any drug, medicine, article or thing designed for producing abortion. If that's true, then it lays the groundwork for a federal ban on abortion. All means of abortion invariably go through interstate commerce. Pills must be shipped to providers, even if they are not ultimately mailed to patients. The medical instruments used in procedural abortions must travel across state lines to reach their destinations. In a modern economy, it is just inevitable that something designed for an abortion will go through interstate commerce. The Fifth Circuit appears to think that that's all a federal crime. If it's right then the Comstock Act is effectively a 50-state abortion ban. The Justice Department will now ask the Supreme Court for an emergency stay on the Fifth Circuit's ruling. The justices will have to respond one way or another because of the competing orders. A federal judge in Washington State, Thomas Rice, has ordered the agency to continue allowing mifepristone without the barriers resurrected by the Fifth Circuit in 17 states and D.C. Only the Supreme Court can resolve these mutually exclusive orders. Whoops, I forgot to turn the sound back down after using the pronunciation guide. 
In the meantime, the FDA should announce that it will not impose the barriers revived by the Fifth Circuit, resting on its enforcement discretion. Uh, the agency has clear authority to say that it will not take any action against medical providers who do not comply with the Fifth Circuit's order. And no matter how the agency responds, doctors will still retain clear authority to prescribe mifepristone off-label beyond 50 days of pregnancy. And finally, if all else fails, abortion providers can start to prescribe misoprostol, or misoprostol only abortions. How about that? Misoprostol is usually the second drug used in a medication abortion, but it is also effective on its own, though it causes slightly more complications and discomfort. One irony of this case is that the plaintiffs say they want fewer patients suffering side effects, but I guess that will be the end result of the ban of mifepristone. Hi everybody, it's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time, just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad! Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction, and whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure, recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't do it without you hope you'll be on board soon too thanks for all your support all right welcome back now to the k in the morning show here on netroots radio there's a little bit more to read about this and uh, once again you know getting myself into a situation where there's just not enough time to cover all the things that i think are important to, that you know before the weekend anyway reassurance from greg that we are more or less on the right track and pronouncing things correctly uh I can just conclude Mark, uh, Mark Joseph Stearns, uh, Mark Stearns, anyway, uh, article here by saying, okay, yeah, we read that, uh, it ends up being, you know, uh, hypocritical in a sense. This ruling, of course, because the judge, uh, the doctors who were making the claim to Judge Kosmarek said they were out to prevent women from suffering from side effects, uh, of mifepristone, as it turns out, mifepristone being used in combination with misoprostol actually is uh, healthier and better outcomes for them. And that they face, uh, as Greg describes it, a lot more, you know, likelihood of uh, cramping if they're using the misoprostol only, but they'll still get the end result they were looking for. It's just that mifepristone was making things easier for them. But as you know, uh, these doctors were not about making anything easier for anybody. They were out for a political victory. Well, anyway, as they say here, um, right, as he says, one irony of the case is that this would happen, and that fact alone uh, should defeat their claim to standing. Anyway, this whole case, he says, is a humiliating mess for the judiciary, and it remains very possible that at least five justices will see that. The Fifth Circuit tried to strike a pose of moderation, but it failed badly. If the Supreme Court does not stay its decision, it will have allowed federal judges to overrule the FDA's expert authority for the first time, permanently undermining the gold standard of drug approval. And uh, that's going to worry the pharmaceutical companies. And you'll see uh, that it's working already. This case is not just a threat to reproductive autonomy. It's a frontal assault on the entire biotech and pharmaceutical field's ability to function with constant catastrophic interference, uh, it's their ability to function. Why is it a threat to their ability to function? Constant catastrophic interference from unelected judges who will impose their will at any cost. And indeed, 
as this has been going on. Uh, Greg sends me the tweet of Chris Geidner, who follows all things legal all the time, and says, breaking news here, Danko Laboratories files an emergency motion at SCOTUS for a full stay of Kazmarek's ruling in the Texas Mifepristone case pending appeal. Um, let's see. Uh, and uh, the, the text of the screen grab that he has here says, Leaving the Fifth Circuit's ruling in place will irreparably harm Danco, which will be unable to both conduct its business nationwide and comply with its legal obligations under the FDCA nationwide. The lack of emergency relief from this court will also harm women, the healthcare system, the pharmaceutical industry, states' sovereignty interests, and the separation of powers. That's a long list. The court should stay the district court's preliminary injunction in full pending appeal. In the alternative, the court should grant certiorari before judgment and set this case for expedited briefing and argument before the summer recess. That's the request. We'll see how they react to it here. Chris goes on to say DOJ has said it will be filing at SCOTUS as well. We're still awaiting that filing. Um, And let's see. Danko says that if the SCOTUS isn't willing to issue a full stay while the Fifth Circuit considers the appeal, it should skip the Fifth Circuit and SCOTUS should take up the case on the merits now and expedite it so that there's a final decision this term. And uh, yes, of course, the Fifth Circuit can reconsider the case on bunk, uh, all the full panel of the Fifth Circuit sitting. I don't know whether that's better or worse. Perhaps there'll be some more judges with some conscience. I mean, even the conservative appointees on the Fifth Circuit, if they're non-Trumpy, uh, were at least open to the idea that, no, this is just a terrible ruling on the merits of, uh, well, on the legal merits, and that it just doesn't deserve to go forward. Anyway, let's see. Uh, breaking news even further. Uh, DOJ asks SCOTUS to immediately halt Kazmarek Smith for Pristone order from going into effect at midnight to halt his ruling from going into effect during appeals. Uh, DOJ writing, this court should put a stop to that untenable situation by staying the district court's order in full. What's the untenable situation? I imagine it's the... Um, Uh, One, the conflict among the circuits, and two, the untenable position that it puts doctors in and pharmaceutical companies and, of course, the women awaiting treatment. Let's see if we can read the uh, screen grabs he's chosen for us here. The abrupt shift in the regulatory landscape that would be required by the lower court's orders raises a host of unprecedented issues and has put FDA and regulated entities in an impossible position. Regulated entities are trying to discern their legal duties and urgently demanding guidance. FDA has spent the last week first grappling with the implications of the district court's order, then racing to untangle the different and enormously more complicated issues raised by the Fifth Circuit's decision. And in the meantime, another district court has enjoined FDA from doing anything to change the conditions on the distribution of Mifepristone in 17 states and the District of Columbia, which means that FDA risks contempt if it takes action to permit the marketing of Mifepristone in a manner consistent with the Fifth Circuit's order. This court should put a stop to that untenable situation by staying the district court's order in full. To the government's knowledge, this is the first time any court has abrogated FDA's conditions of a, on a drug's approval based on a disagreement with the agency's judgment about safety, much less done so after those conditions have been in effect for years. And the lower courts reach that unprecedented result only through a series of fundamental errors that violate black letter Article 3 and administrative law principles. And one more grab here. This court should, uh, oh, is this not the, it's, oh, this is just expanded this one. I thought there was a third screen grab here. No, I guess that's probably it. We must have missed the first screen grab. Anyway, you get the idea. Uh, so there we are, I think, up to date on what's happening. That, the uh, latest edition was only like 15 minutes ago. Uh, here is an NBC News article about, I think, the Danko um, motion here. And, uh, let's see what other things do we want to add to this? Uh, ha ha ha. Let's see. I'm reading this along here. Well, it's something that, uh, Greg sent along here. Uh, 
that's oh, okay. Maybe an explanation for the 17 states. No judge in Texas or the Fifth Circuit gets to override what a federal judge in Washington state has decided. Washington State Attorney General Bob Ferguson told CNBC earlier Thursday, Ferguson led the lawsuit to preserve access in the 17 states and the district. Okay. Um, Abortion rights groups and the 17 state attorneys general. Oh, okay. Maybe that's it. This is, there, there were 17 state, state attorneys general that joined in the suit that landed before Thomas Rice. And so in granting their pleadings, the 17 states that signed up for this essentially and DC, uh, get this protection. Okay. Abortion rights groups and 17 states attorney, state attorneys general in the case praised Rice's order, which was largely ignored by anti-abortion groups who were focused on Matthew Kaczmarek's decision. All right, and then uh, a, uh, a profile, I guess, on Thomas Rice in the Washington Post, if you are interested. Um, let's see. I'll just read you the second paragraph here, see what the meat of it is. Rice, an Obama-appointed judge, ordered the FDA to preserve the status quo and retain access in 17 states and D.C., his ruling stands in contrast to Kuzmarix. Uh Who is he? Well, I guess the rest of the article is dedicated to that. Let's see. Confirmed by the Senate 93 to 4 uh, in March of 2012. Assistant U.S. attorney in the same district from 1987 until his appointment. From 86 to 87, he worked in the tax division of the Justice Department. Received both law degree and bachelor's degree from Gonzaga University. So, you know, a local boy made good. All right. Let's see. Uh, all right. I think that basically catches up uh, us up to speed. And there's some more background information on rice if you're interested. Uh, and we'll include that in today's roundup. Now, I guess, let's see. What other things do we need to turn our attention to? Hmm. There's a lot and not that much time to do it. I'm just trying to think of when, yeah, we better uh, get to this too. Rosalind McGregor had sent us another installment of what's going on, and it's relevant to all of the discussion we've had to date. It's going to cut a little bit into our time to update you on the uh, weirdo arrested for espionage, but I think you've probably already caught up on that. Uh, and by the way, thanks to Darwin for saying, you know, you sounded a little self-conscious about devoting so much time to that that story yesterday and he just wanted to assure me that uh, he uh, perhaps as a gamer himself uh, actually appreciated the time that was spent on it so I hope that's the case with all of you too even if you're not gamers I thought it was pretty fascinating uh, and and an interesting I was glad we took some time to just sort of that I took some time and and you listened to uh, just sort of expanding on the between the lines interpretation of what was going on there yesterday. Cause I don't think any of the writers are going to go out on that limb, but I, I thought that there was a lot to be said about the parallels to QAnon conspiracy theories and online uh, incel groups and grooming that was going on. And nobody wants to level those charges. And with good reason, you know, it's dangerous when you get into that territory. But but I see a lot of parallels going on there, and uh, that's sort of psychoanalysis not likely to make the printed uh, legal and political analysis that they'll permit themselves. Anyway, as I said, Rosalind McGregor has a related issue uh, about Ron DeSantis coming to Michigan to do his campaign shtick, and of course... Uh, he's going to have to bring with him the whole uh, MAGA brief in order to make the case that, you know, he should be considered the successor to Trump and he's going to have to play the abortion card, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, how did he do? Well, let's let's roll the tape and find out. Good morning, David. Your listeners will recall that I shared news in the past about the connection between Hillsdale College in Michigan and New College in Florida, thanks to Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. DeSantis campaigned in Michigan recently. He visited a Midland County GOP fundraiser as well as speaking at Hillsdale College. Quote, DeSantis' speech was a test run for campaign messaging in front of a safe crowd, said David Dulio, a political science professor at Oakland University. 
Other major conservative areas like Macomb County and Kent County may be too loyal to Trump or too moderate, respectively. Those are incredibly important counties in a general election, but may not be the place to test drive a primary campaign message, Julio explained. For Midland County GOP Chair Kathy Lycom, DeSantis' visit was not a boost for his presidential bid. The party just wanted a big-name conservative leader to headline its fundraising breakfast, and talks began back in January. DeSantis spoke to a crowd of more than 600 that included a who's who of Michigan conservative politics. Quote, Our bottom line is we do not surrender to the woke mob, DeSantis said. Florida's where woke goes to die. In what used to be a swing state, the Democratic Party in Florida is a hollow shell, DeSantis said. It's like a dead carcass on the side of the road, unquote. During his speech at Hillsdale College, DeSantis had a long list of people, groups, and ideas he took issue with, but it may be the legacy media that he attacked more than anything else. Quote, we don't talk to the media, DeSantis told the audience. We've had no leaks in the media for over four years, and they get very upset about that. DeSantis noted that he has, quote, press conferences and anyone can come on and ask me questions, but we treat them as political actors, similar to how we'll treat a Democratic operative, the governor said. They don't like to be treated that way, but why would we give them the satisfaction of acting like they're some type of referee of the process? Because they're not. During DeSantis' speech and subsequent conversation with Hillsdale College President Larry Arne, DeSantis said he pays little attention to the media, but listed extensive examples of news outlets criticism of him. If I see the New York Times, I just ignore it. I mean, I just don't care, DeSantis told Arne. Arne was tapped by Trump to chair the ex-president's 1776 commission, a group that promoted education about the United States, inspiring and unifying founding, and which landed vehement criticism from historians across the country. Sophia Brown, a senior at the New College of Florida and editor of its school newspaper, The Catalyst, said that the changes DeSantis is pushing at her school are concerning and amount to a politicization of our administration. Under the new trustees, New College's top diversity offer was officer was fired following the trustees' vote to eliminate the school's Office of Outreach and Inclusive Excellence. Quote, DeSantis is not going to stop with Florida, Brown said. This can easily spread to other states. It's important to call out the things we know are not right that are threatening educational freedom. It could be your school next, unquote. That's my contribution for today. Let me encourage other listeners to share their thoughts or news items about their local political situation. Just talk into your smartphone's voice memo app. Easy peasy. Help David by giving him a chance to put Scott's tea to good use and let his <laughs> voice rest for a few minutes. He'll appreciate it. Back to you, David. Rosalind McGregor signing off. Thank you, Rosalind. I do appreciate it. Uh, oh, we didn't go with tea today. All right. Well, I had the opportunity to do that, and I love easy peasy. It just makes me laugh, just generally speaking. And it is. It's certainly true, uh, and obviously Great encouragement for you all to do the same, and she just described exactly what you need to do. Got a smartphone? You can be on the air. All right. Thanks, Rosalyn. And it was important to check back in. Uh, yeah. So it wasn't really so much abortion issue as it was the Hillsdale College, new college issue and just uh, Ron DeSantis's sort of uh, trial balloons for campaigning in general. And uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on that. All right. So let's see. Um, I, I guess I won't read because you'll probably want to read. Uh, you, you don't need to be motivated by me at this point to read up on what happened with the arrest in the espionage case. It turns out that the uh, baby faced kid that they arrested for all this uh, kid by the name of what's his name? Jack Tahara uh, in Massachusetts. He's an Air National Guard airman. Uh, or Air, Na yeah, Air National Guard guy who got uh, mobilized and works in an intelligence operation, but just generally speaking, uh, fixes the computers there. And, you know, that's going to require some access to some secret documents. And uh, because he's such a patriot, he decided he would show everybody all of those documents. Um, I will point out, I was just sort of skimming to see uh, were there any uh, real news revelations in there. And I don't know if there's revelations per se, but there was... Uh, this comment or these comments here that uh, remember that they were speaking to anonymous sources who knew him online for yesterday's discussion. And uh, 
they were saying, uh, let's see, a friend of his, apparently, who was on the Discord server, uh, said that, uh, let's see, a friend recalled that Tahera started sharing classified documents on the Discord server last year during the war in Ukraine, which is, of course, still going on, which he saw as a depressing battle between two countries that should have more in common than keeping them apart. Oh, dear. Oh, well. Anyway, sharing the classified documents was meant to educate people who he thought were his friends and could be trusted. But, you know, so what? The 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 obligation of that you were given as a member of the armed forces and in the job role that you took on was not to do that. So it's not really up to you to decide who could be trusted. That's someone else's job. Your job was to adhere to the agreement that you not share this information. And so now you didn't do that, so you'll go to jail. But anyway, uh, he wanted to, he meant to educate people who he thought were his friends and could be trusted, free from the propaganda swirling outside, the friend said. The men and boys on the server never uh, agreed never to share the documents outside the server since they might harm U.S. interests. But guess what? A, that's not enough. B, that's not your decision to make. And C, you really can't secure the information, can you? What infrastructure have you got to make sure that uh, there's security here? Oh, well, we promised each other. Well, that's really not good enough. Um, at any rate, he says, I was of the opinion, this, this friend says, that some of these kids were prone to run their mouths because they spend too much time online. But I was ignored, said the friend. So he's the wise guy. He knew. I, I was ignored. Anyway, he tried, he added that he tried to stay out of such discussions. It was pretty obnoxious to see kids who grew up in the suburbs argue about a conflict an ocean away. Uh, but that's also called uh, reading the news and having an opinion. And, you know, that's not that obnoxious. Around half of this is the important thing, I think. Around half of the server's members were, quote, kids in their basements playing video games, while the other half were gun enthusiasts who, I guess, were just interested in the fact that there were groomable teenage boys around. Don't know why. Uh, recent claims, though, by others who were on the server that some of its members were Russian and Ukrainian were, quote, pure fabrication, the friend said. One member, pretending to be a Russian naval officer, actually lived in Kentucky, he said, and was kicked out as though that was like vindication. Well, we found out that he was lying and we kicked him out. But it's, I think, somewhat interesting and telling to note that when it comes to pretending to be something cool and awesome in order to, you know, project whatever image it was they were interested in, among the, this group of 25 supposedly close friends, uh, the thing you choose to pretend to be is a Russian naval officer. That's not likely to work in the first place and not a great thing to pretend to be anyway. Um, but there you have it. And, and I mean, the fact that that was considered a plausible ploy even though it was eventually detected and and uh, and he was ejected, uh, tells you about where these guys are operating. Like, you know, that you had a reasonable chance of putting it past these idiots that you were a Russian naval officer when you were a kid in your mom's basement in Kentucky. How like, okay, he was kicked out. How long did it take you to figure that out? I'm a little curious about that. Well, anyway... Uh, the whole excuse of this thing is, is summed up here. It was only supposed to be keeping kids informed about real world issues, the friend said. Well, you know, you could just read the newspaper and discuss your skepticism of reporters accounts of things. You don't have to educate kids in anybody's basement anywhere about anything. I mean, they're hung. They may be hungry for the education, but you can't use classified information to do it. That's just not going to fly as an excuse. That's just dumb. Anyway, uh, what can I tell you? And and by the way, uh, so that also led Murdery Trader Green to say he just told the truth. And, and it, please keep in mind that he also told these kids that the Buffalo uh, supermarket mass shooting was a government operation designed to uh, be able to, you know, to, to drum up support for either gun control or more money for police or what have you. And that now separates this idiot's worldview, not at all from QAnon lunacy and the idea that he quote unquote told the truth is entirely polluted by, and that was never a good excuse to begin with telling the truth. I mean, wonderful. I, I understand why that's supposed to be uh, an underlying value, but he's also uh, 
recklessly lying in a manner designed to uh, lead kids away from the truth for no good reason either, by the way, except for presumably his love of racism and guns. So uh, this is a despicable person and there's no redeeming it, quite honestly, and and no interest in, on my part or really on any reasonable person's part on trying to mitigate it. The guy goes to prison and that's the end of it. And basically they should be thinking about that possibility for everybody who was on the server too and let them argue their way out of it individually. All right, a couple other things uh, that I want to share with you. Now that uh, we're down to a lower amount of time, gosh, there's something that's been waiting for weeks to go on and I, maybe I'll just blurt it out and just say every time I keep trying to return to the idea that we should spend some time taking a look at the emerging um, alliance that they keep referring to every once in a while when we do foreign policy stuff as the BRICS alliance, right? Brazil, Russia, India, uh, I remember now the S, but China, I can't leave out the C, and, China, and the S is South Africa. And they're sort of, you know, uh, I don't know what, they're the, like the left outs of foreign policy getting together and saying, well, what if we, if, you know, our populations are gigantic. And our reach is global. What if we came together as people who were picked last in uh, the international games of dodgeball and said we can reorient foreign policy or we're strong enough to reorient foreign policy around our axis, even if we don't really have all that much in common besides being left out of so many things. And they apparently have had some success in doing so. And the Chinese claim that it was their guidance and uh, a part of the, you know, idea, the project of building the BRICS axis, I guess, to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran to the table to settle once and for all the international uh, tensions and conflict, not only between their two countries, but between Sunni and Shia Muslims and the oil and gas commerce in the Persian Gulf, which then I guess China could then uh, horn in on and and see if they could uh, redirect some of that resources to themselves at favorable prices. Maybe that was what, in part, what motivated it. But uh, I wanted to, I, I, one, it has, that whole move has puzzled our foreign policy elite, and they're only now getting around to trying to uh, uh, describe what was going on and analyze what was going on in a way that still, you know, retains American dominance as part of the picture and saying, no, this alliance will go nowhere. I'm not so sure. I don't know, but I'm not a foreign policy guy per se. But I was also interested, though, in one of the first tests of whether or not this rapprochement between the two countries was going to mean anything was if it was going to mean anything to ending the war in Yemen. And as it turns out, uh, maybe it's just a big maybe. Uh, I understand that the Saudis have sent a delegation and that they're meeting with people in Yemen about the poss. This that whole war was driven by Sunni Shia tensions in general, and if it's the case that Saudi Arabia and Iran can negotiate some uh, détente, that perhaps that they could do the same for Yemen. Uh, not sure yet, though, whether that's window dressing just to make it look like the whole thing is real, whereas, you know, there might be real politic reasons for settling with Iran, but not necessarily with Yemen. But uh, I don't know. So it could be that uh, they just simply are going to make it look like they're ready to settle the case in Yemen and call an end to the war so that it looks legit and it, they keep the Iranians happy or will they really use it? I mean, at, at worst, it's an excuse to stop spending so much money and looking so terrible internationally if they can get the agreement, perhaps, of the Iranians to keep, you know, instead of us keeping the Houthi, Houthi, is that the right pronunciation? Uh, Shia rebels in Yemen under the Saudi thumb, why don't you show your good faith to us by keeping them under the Iranian thumb, but just keeping them quiet and compliant? And that might be enough. And then, of course, oops, I still forgot to turn down the sound on that thing. Uh, that, that would serve Saudi interests and also subjugate Shia uh, Yemenites. So, you know, everybody 
quote unquote wins, except of course to people who have been under the thumb of the Saudi military for the past X number of years. They'll just switch thumbs. I don't know whether they'll find that preferable. Okay, time to wrap things up and uh, prepare you for Justice Putnam's West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But first, I want to, you know, quickly do two, maybe three more things. Mitch McConnell, I finally heard, uh, ready to return to the Capitol after a five-week absence, according to The Hill. So that question about when he would return, what it might mean for the Feinstein thing, what it might mean for everything else, uh, whether or not there would be a filibuster of any proposed changes on the Judiciary Committee. I don't know the answer to that and whether they'll be collegial or whether McConnell's return signals that they will flex their muscles and try to prevent Democrats from making an, an easy transition. But he's on his way back. So we have that news. Uh, let's see. Anything else that I need to throw in there quickly before we... Uh, oh, mm, well, I'm not going to be able to fit that one in. Okay. I mean, I think that's actually it. Uh, oh, that's right. Hmm. I'll have to save these things because they deserve more attention than that. So here's what we'll do. Let's, like I said, turn our attention to what's coming up next right here on Netroots Radio and gently read through all of what justice has provided for us. Let's see. Starting off in the Bistro Cafe on Blue Moon Spirits Friday. Clarence Thomas has absolutely violated federal law. That's got to be about the house purchase. We'll uh, check in on that. Then on the rest of the menu, an Orange County, California school district wants to overrule its own literature review committee of educators and parents, raising concerns of book bans. Uh Uh-oh, listen to parents until they stop banning books, eh? Oregon likely broke federal law by hiring over 100 unqualified special education teachers for the school year. And the Arkansas Attorney General is working hard to convince the courts racism is over. Everyone knows that. So it's okay to segregate the schools again because now we don't start racism. And uh, international news as well. I'll tell you about that after this. NetworksRadio.com. You have been listening to KGRO in the morning with David Waldman. As I said, international news. Norway expelled 15 Russian diplomats suspected of spying. And Slovakia's central bank chief was fined for bribery, but still faces a trial. All that and more on the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef de Cuisine, Justice Putnam. Next, we come back on Monday. See you then.